Hi, Ninja Nerds. In this video, we're going to be talking about gastroesophageal reflux disease, also known as GERD. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, comment down below, don't forget to subscribe, and check out ninjanerd.org. Let's get started here on GERD. So when we're talking about GERD, so we are going to be talking about how this can occur and affect our patients. So on the board here, what I drew out was just a generic diaphragm, diaphragm, diagram of our anatomy. So let's go over that really quickly. We have here the esophagus. So when we eat something, it flows down from the esophagus into our stomach, right? And then eventually into our intestines right here. And that's basic anatomy that we can recall typically from our anatomy class, but there is some anatomy in here that you may not remember or may not have talked about for a long, long, long time. And there's two sphincters that we're gonna talk about. Right here and right here. So I picture these sphincters as like the two doors that get us into the room of the stomach, right? We have the one right here, which is the lower esophageal sphincter, also abbreviated LES. And then we have the pyloric sphincter. All right, so these two sphincters are the opening and closing, right? They're able to open and close and allow passaging of food, fluid, whatever needs to go in and out. So if you think of it as a square, so I'll draw it like this. And we have our two sphincters here that are able to open and close. So they're able to contract and relax and allow permission of things to pass through. So as something flows in, it gets into here, and you can see that if it got really full in here, really, really full, a lot of people are at this party, it's crowded, all of a sudden it's gonna push on this sphincter to open up and it's gonna flow out. But if it gets so full that it actually starts to push on this sphincter here and wants to go back through, then we're gonna have some reflux. And that's what we're gonna talk about today is the GERD that occurs within our stomach. And we wanna think basically right now, what are some of those basis of this not functioning properly? So we just talked about it. One, if it's over full in here, so you eat so much, you know, you work a 12 hour shift as a nurse, and then you go and eat a bunch, a bunch of food after 13 hours of not eating and taking care of everybody else but yourself, all of a sudden your stomach is ballooned out. It's huge, it's expanding. You've overeaten so much. You might say, mm, having a little indigestion, having a little, <clears throat> You know, and there's a little backflow through this LES right in here, and maybe you just have a little bit of irritation. But over time, that can cause some issues, right? Another problem that we could also have if, if it's not being full, but this isn't closing, right? We have this opening and closing of this sphincter, and all of a sudden this sphincter isn't closing all the way. Something's going on. A lot of different things can make it not close properly. It's allowing a little opening, and we're getting some reflux through there. And all of those problems have a real... Um, issue that we're going to talk about, these contributing factors that can cause an issue with our GERD, and cause this to occur within our body. But let's break it down a little bit more into our anatomy and go back and talk about our gastric pits. So we have all these different layers within our stomach. And in those layers, we have the mucosa, which is our, our layer that's interacting with all of those gastric juices, it's interacting with the mucus, it's interacting with the food. But in those gastric pits, we have all these different cells that are lining these pits and allow a secretion of these juices to come out, right? So these cells that we need to talk about are these cells right here. We have three cells that we need to just touch on really quickly, which are our chief, our parietal, and our G cells. So we have our chief cells, and our chief cells help us release pepsinogen, which eventually becomes pepsin. I have our parietal cells, which help us release hydrochloric acid, and our G cells that help us release gastrin. And gastrin helps stimulate the parietal cell to release the H cell and the pepsin, and those are the two that are really important in our stomach. So our pepsin and our HCL. All right, and these are going to help with our digestion. They're gonna help break things down. And then we're gonna have our mucosa that is going to protect the mucus. It's going to protect our mucosa layer against these corrosive acids. And the stomach 
is made for this environment. The stomach is made for this digestion. It's made for this um, battle against the acids and the mucus on the mucosa, helping protect it so that we don't get all this erosion. But if there's imbalances in those, we have some other things occurring like ulcers. But we want to look at this as its basic happy environment, that it, pepsin and HCL are doing its digestion, the mucus is protecting the mucosa, and everything's working happily. But when we start to get this reflux, then we can start to see some issues. When we have reflux, we have that corrosive gas or corrosive juices and things flying up where maybe they shouldn't be. So they're coming up through here and they're going to go in the esophagus. Think back to anatomy again, this is all anatomy. The esophagus and the stomach have a different mucosal layer. They are made for different purposes. They have different functions. So the stomach has that nice mucosal lining with the mucus that's helping protect it. But the esophagus doesn't have essentially the same stuff. So when this reflux occurs and it goes up in here, that reflux is going to cause some irritation. And that irritation can cause inflammation. Right? So then you're going to have a patient come in and say, I don't know, I just got kind of like a little agita, a little like burpy. It feels a little burny down there. And those are typical signs and symptoms of GERD. But over time, if this is occurring chronically, this patient has really, really uh, intense GERD that's occurring, lots of reflux, it might be going all the way up the esophagus, it's going to damage that esophagus. And when we have that damaging, we have something called scarring, right? So over time, there's a scarring that is occurring within the esophagus. The scarring, as it occurs in the esophagus, can start to close the lumen or make the opening look smaller, so a decrease in the diameter of the esophagus. And because of that, we can get stenosis in our esophagus. And that's what we're going to be talking about, is how can this GERD occur? Why is this occurring? Well, there's a couple of risk factors that we can talk about really quickly is obesity. So if our patient is obese, if they're getting older, so they have a decrease in the tone of the LES, because the, the LES is working with pressures, it's working with function, and if something within that LES is not occurring properly, just over time, like the heart, the, the valves are losing tone, they don't work as well as they should when they were younger. Smoking and then a hiatal hernia. You're probably like, hiatal hernia, that's a word that I know. I've heard those before. I can't think about what that is. Remember, a hiatal hernia is if part of the stomach kind of gets pinched up by the diaphragm. So you have your diaphragm here, and the stomach is getting a little pinched up here. So we have this pinching on the stomach here. And then we have this pouch that is causing some issues with the, the decrease in the reflux of going up back into the esophagus. So what are some of these contributing factors? Let's think about what's going on with our patient. What are some of these contributing factors that could be causing our patient to have some type of GERD symptoms? Well, first, the biggest things is you want to think about the foods that are going to relax our LES, our sphincter, right? Like I told you before, it could be that it's having a problem of opening and closing. So if it's staying open, it's keeping that door wide open, it's letting anyone just go back back in, back out. Like if you've ever gone to a concert and they say, once you leave, you can't come back in. Well, the LES ain't working right, so you can go back up the esophagus. And that's caused from a couple foods that will relax it. What are some foods or things within food that will relax it? You want to think about caffeine. You want to think about anything that is pop, right? So carbonated. You want to think about peppermint. You're probably screaming at the back of my head saying spicy, things that are spicy, spicy foods, fatty foods, overly fatty foods, and chocolate. All of these types of foods can cause a relaxation in the LES and it is allowing for that reflux to occur. There's also, again, we touched on this before, overeating. When it's too packed full in the stomach, it's got nowhere else to go but back out from where it came eating really quickly and then lying flat so then you're going to lay down allowing for gravity to not work in your favor and allowing that food to possibly uh, create that irritation or that reflux and then certain types of medications. So we have these patients that come into our facility and they're going to talk to us and like I think I have GERD or I think I have an issue with some GERD or what's going on they're not sure I think I just have heartburn. They're going to have a lot of these signs and symptoms. So a lot of the symptoms that we're going to look over here are 
things that in your head you're like, that makes sense, I think they have GERD. So we have dyspepsia, right? So this is like that dis discomfort, that indigestion feeling that the patient can have. So we would put indigestion. They're gonna also have pain, right? So the pain or that heartburn feeling because that is the common name for GERD. They're gonna also have dysphagia, right? Or that painful with swallowing. They, depending on how high this is refluxing up, it could go all the way up into the pharynx and the larynx and cause some issues and irritation up there. So one of those could be the dysphagia, the pain with eating or swallowing. And then we're also gonna have that chronic cough. Again, it's irritating the larynx and the pharynx. So what are those two big red flags you're gonna be looking at? When you talk to your patient, you're asking them all these questions, you're assessing them. What are those two big red flags that you're saying, uh, this sounds like the clinical setup for a person that might have GERD? It's gonna be pain after what? Eating. So if they have typical pain after eating, especially right in that substernal like kind of chest where we think, is this your heart or is this just GERD? So they're gonna have that burning right in that heartburn. And then we're also gonna say it's worse when they do what? They eat and then they lie flat. So let's go on and talk about what are some of the diagnostic tests that may be ordered to help us identify, is this a patient that's having a heart issue or is this a patient that really is having GERD? All right, so now we're gonna go into the diagnostics. And what we're looking at here is how are we gonna tell um, if our patient, what's going on with their GERD, how is this occurring? So if a patient came into the, the ER and they were having this substernal like burning or chest pain, we would immediately decide EKG, rule out all of the cardiac, and then once we are able to tell them, okay, this might be a, a GERD issue, this might be an acid reflux is, issue, then we're gonna go into eventually talking to them of the more specialized treatment, talking to a gastrologist, and going through some diagnostics to see what's going on with their GERD. So one of the, the gold standards for identifying if a patient has GERD is the esophageal pH monitoring. And essentially what that is is there's this long, it goes through the nose down to the esophagus, has all these little electrodes on it that are going to monitor the pH of the esophagus. So we'll be able to see what's going on with the patient's pH. And what we want to look for here is two things. We want to tell the patient to make sure they are keeping a journal of all the food that they eat and all the symptoms that they're having for this because it's going to last anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. And we wanna be able to read all of those pH readings and we'll be able to see it all through the esophagus. Is it high, is it low, is it somewhere in the middle? What's going on with their readings and how is it occurring with their foods? If the doc wants to do that or if they do that and there's something that's maybe not or it's inconclusive, it's not as conclusive as they want it to be, they might do an EGD as well where we're gonna put in that long purple scope here and go down and check out the duodenal, we'll check out the stomach and we'll check out the esophagus, right? So this is the long scope. And we'll be able to see things on here as well to take a biopsy. And what we do with that then is able to test it and send it off to the lab to see what's going on. And the last would be a barium swallow study. A barium swallow study is when they swallow the barium, helps coat everything within inside the body, and then we're gonna be able to find out if there's any issues within the mucosa, like an ulcer, or anything else going on, like a stricture with this patient as well. So these are just ways for us to identify what is going on with their GERD, what type of GERD is occurring, and why is it occurring within our patient. Then we're gonna move into also medications to help out these patients as well because we wanna make sure that we are getting them as comfortable as we can and also help them with this situation. So the main medication that a patient is gonna get is a proton pump inhibitor, also known as a PPI. Those are your medications that are gonna end in the azole. All right, so A-Z-O-L-E. And what these are going to allow to do is try to decrease basically the proton pump inhibitor or decrease all of those gastric ju ju juices. We also have the antacids. Antacids are gonna help neutralize, right? So if you're giving them any type of antacid, you know, usually people that have um, mild, very, very mild GERD, just right after you eat, you're having just a little indigestion, a little agita, you can take a tum or two, and you're gonna feel a lot better afterwise. But if they need it long-term, there are certain types of antacids we can give them as well. And then there's also the histamine two receptor antagonists, and those are also going to help decrease. Okay, all of that gastric production. 
Now let's quickly just talk about the complications that our patients can have. One of them would be aspiration of these um, secretions. So what would happen is it would go so far up into the esophagus that it could eventually get down into the lungs a little bit, causing that chronic cough or any type of asthma exacerbation, which we wouldn't want. And also the development of a Barrett's epithelium, which is our Barrett's esophagus, where they're gonna have some issues with swallowing, their issues with taking food in as well. And we want to just talk to our patients about their lifestyle changes. If they're in the group of people that maybe we can help alter what's going on, kind of get back before we get to a Barrett's esophagus and kind of um, decrease those triggers and those lifestyle changes that we can make in order to not progress so far along in this disease pattern. So what we want to look at here is typically weight loss. And when we say weight loss, we're not just saying, oh, you, you need to lose weight. It comes twofold. You need to think about the eating habits of the patient. Are they eating very large meals, which are stimulating that stretch response within the stomach, causing an increase of those secretions of hydrochloric acid and pepsin? Are they eating really, really fatty foods? Are they eating a plethora of the foods that they shouldn't be eating, like a lot of caffeine, a lot of fatty foods, a lot of chocolate, a lot of spicy foods? And are they having um, a decrease in things that are going to help the body out and help digest. So with those dietary changes, maybe along with GERD and along with the weight loss, they also have trouble with lactulose or they have lactose with any type of milk or dairy products. So you wanna look into that as well and talk to these patients because it's not gonna be an easy change. These are habits that they're gonna possibly have to change over some time. We also want them to not be eating near bedtime. Again, eating really quickly and then lying flat eating a lot of food, lying flat, it's just going to cause that backflow or that reflux. And also sleeping possibly with the head of the bed slightly elevated or even in a recliner if they are in a chronic flare up so that we are able to allow that reflux to go down and slowly um, produce through the stomach into the intestines rather than refluxing back up into the esophagus. So I hope this made sense. I hope you understand a little bit more of how GERD works within the system so that way you can teach your patients and talk to them about what's going on inside their body and I hope it made sense for you. And as always, until next time.